Hi, I'm a Year 12 student at an independent boys' school. Uh, I've witnessed firsthand how a dangerous culture of sexism and misogyny can easily be promoted amongst students. Are boys at same-sex schools being prepared enough for the world outside Year 12? And what can I be doing as a student to be a better ally for women? Finn McCready with that question. I made up the surname. Uh, v, <laughs> what's your view on that? Uh, uh, is there this sort of toxic masculinity that we hear about, that we've seen in, in the news? Yeah, I definitely think that there is a culture of toxic masculinity. And I think one of the problems we have is that we give them this justification of, oh, boys will be boys, you know, like, that's just how they are. But we have to understand that the actions that arise are not acceptable. And it's not just about your gender, but it's about actually sometimes the crimes that they commit. So I'm so tired of hearing, you know, oh, it's just like, just let them be, they'll grow up. But if we don't teach them now but that what they're doing is wrong, then we can't actually tackle the problem when they all go out into the workplace and possibly contribute to workplace harassment. I know, you know, in the news that we see, obviously, in the recent case with the tram chants, that these usually private school boys, they feel like that they have the confidence and that they feel they have the courage, or oh, that's a positive word, but they have this audacity to say such things in public. And then we see numerous incidences of sexual assault and sexual harassment of schoolboys showing, you know, their friends nudes without the girl's um, actual consent or that they're taking pictures up girls' skirts. And we have to understand that it's not OK. And I know that I'm lucky, in, lucky to have not faced that direct sexual harassment or assault, but there shouldn't be a lucky one. There shouldn't be a fortunate person. A woman shouldn't have to feel like they're unsafe in their own school environment. And I shouldn't have to sit in a class or sit with my peers and think, there is a girl here that has been sexually harassed or even assaulted. And we need to start holding these students accountable. And also, we need to stop thinking that what we're doing currently is enough, because we see after incident and after incident that what we're doing isn't enough. I think suspensions, personally, you know, on paper to the school, it might look like a serious consequence, but actually try and think it back to the victim or to the perpetrator. To the p perpetrator, potentially a few days off school is, you know, hooray, I get school off um, days off school and, you know, I'll just move on from that and I'll just live my life and not actually learn my lesson. And then the victim sitting there, you know, being traumatised and is going to impact their entire life and they're thinking how can how can they just get away with it and we need to start holding not only schools but also students accountable for the actions and consequences that they impact upon students uh, uh, there is a great deal of accountability for public schools but you want greater accountability for the private schools which receive public funding explain yeah I, look I, I think um, you know there's this whole argument about funding and um, We're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but I do think that public schools are, are held... Di are treated differently to, to non-government schools, particularly around this issue of, of, account of accountability. I mean, public schools have to record critical incidents. Um, non-government schools record them, but um, they're not necessarily made, made public, whereas in public schools they, they certainly are. And I think in exchange for public funding, uh, any school that gets public funding, whether they be a public school, a Catholic school or an independent school, should be under those same rules of, of accountability and transparency, including how the money should be spent, <laughs> how the money is how the money is allocated, even to, to non-government schools, particularly within non-government school systems. Let's just come in on that one, Hamish. Sure, but I just want to pick up though on that because uh, I noted you had mentioned the paperwork that the Catholic school system had to comply with in order to get. $800 million worth of funding from your state when you were the yep. Education Minister. How much paperwork did they have to do? It was, it was one page. The page the, what I saw when I asked the Department for a brief was it was one page. I'm now, now for, for a $600 million cheque, that's not enough. If you apply for a $30,000 grant for Scouts, you have to do a lot more than that. <laughs> so it wasn't about accusing anybody of doing the wrong thing, but the accountability and the transparency needs to be equal. That way you don't see the, the incidents... Well, less chance of seeing the incidents like we saw in, in Melbourne where, where things can happen in some schools but there's no transparency around, unless police get involved or, mm. or somebody finds out about it. John Collier. 
I don't think it's true that there's a lack of accountability in independent schools. In fact, we are overwhelmed with accountability. We're tied up in red tape and compliance. And I spent much of my time, as do my finance people in an independent school, equipping reports to government. Uh, there are about a whole raft of things, student welfare, curriculum, examinations, funding. We report to NESA in New South Wales. We report to the state government. We report to the federal government. Uh, it's simply not the case that we are unaccountable. We are massively accountable. And I have no problem with accountability. My issue is whether all of the raft of paperwork which takes teachers away from their primary task of teaching is actually necessary and justified. And this is a broader issue than what we're discussing right now because the accountability and compliance requirements affect teachers in all sectors and actually take them away from the frontline tasks of teaching and pastoring students. Okay. So I'm not sure that the benefit from that is proportional to the amount of time spent. Hamish, do you mind if we go back to Finn's question just for a second? Because um, he asked two things, like what can we do to change this culture? And I think um, we have had some really effective respectful relationships programs in schools. Uh, I don't think they're widespread enough. It's now in the curriculum, but I, I, I reckon if there's young people in the audience, how many of you feel like you've had effective respectful relationships education so far at school? Yeah, like not a hand's going up for the studio <laughs> for those viewers at home. <laughs> um, and and I, I, so I do think from a very early age, there are great models that teach people about, uh, you know, age appropriate, how to negotiate respectful relationships, how to have healthy friendships uh, as time goes on, how to have healthy sexual relationships as well. Uh, we need to do better. I, I know that the, the teachers will say, oh, I've got one more thing in the curriculum. I, I get that, but this is so fundamental. If it's only being taught at home, uh, at school, and what you're seeing at home is completely contrary to that, then what happens at school isn't going to counteract that. So we have to go well beyond what's happening in schools to what's happening in families, society, community. Adrian was talking about before sporting organisations, politicians have to lead uh, as well to say that um, violence and sexism are never OK, not ever, not in any context, ever. Um, but you said... Um, you also said, what can you do to be a better ally? I think the fact you've asked the question has kind of answered that. You obviously already are. But, but I do have a message for young men. Like, quite often, you will be in a group and things could go one way or the other. You know, someone's vulnerable, someone's on their own, um, someone's about to be bullied, someone's about to be assaulted, harassed. You have to be the leader in that group. And it's hard, it's embarrassing. People think you're, you, you know, straighty 180, whatever. You be that leader. And, um, and that culture change that you do amongst your peers is so much more powerful than me talking about it on television or your teachers or your parents. <laughs> so be the leader in your peer group.